appear before you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and accept acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not conform to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of the mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Amen. Amen. Uh, good morning, everyone. You know, it's not easy to be a visitor because there are certain things that you are not aware of, or you know them, but for some reason it's like, okay. You know, so, uh, thanks, thanks for the scripture reading. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 uh, to verse 2. My topic this morning says, hand over yourself. Um, it's all about us committing ourselves to Jesus Christ. And this morning I just want us to, to remind one another about what it means to, to be a Christian. Now I'm going to, to dwell in the book of Romans. It's a well-known book. I'm sure you do have your own favorite uh, verses from the book of Romans. Uh, who wrote the book of Romans? It's Paul, um, which is very interesting because when you go to chapter 16, uh, we are going to be told that uh, I, Tetius, wrote this, this, this letter to you, whereby uh, we all understand that at the book of Romans, it is not written by the uh, Apostle Paul's hand. Because when you read Romans chapter 16, verse 22, there's a brother there by the, by the name of Tetius. Tetius who wrote down the letter uh, who is greeting us in the Lord. So, in chapter 1, Paul, a servant of Christ, Jesus called to be an apostle and set apart for the gospel of God. So we can understand that as far as the writing of the book of, of, of Romans, Paul did it write with his own hand. He used a scribe by the name of Tetius when we read Romans chapter 16, verse 22. Now, when was this letter written? Uh, it has been written around uh, AD 58 to 50, 57 to 58 on this planned missionary uh, tour. And there's something interesting about this letter. Paul is writing a letter before he went to Rome. And when you read chapter 1, Paul is looking forward to meet his brethren in Rome. We all know um, that in the book of Acts, uh, it ended whereby Paul was in Rome. So he wrote it before he arrived in Rome. Now, there are two purposes why the letter is written. Number one, it has been written to solve certain tensions between Jews and Gentiles Christians in Rome. So there was, um, as, 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 as we do go as, you know, as, as a church, sometimes we do come across tensions, isn't it? And we need uh, to resolve them. So this letter, it is written to, to, to resolve such. Number two, it has been written to introduce himself in preparation for his visit to Rome. You know, he's about to, to visit them, so as, he writing, as, as he's writing the letter, he's preparing them that, you know what, I'll be there very soon. When I don't know, but I'm coming there, and one of the things that he mentioned, he said, I cannot wait to impart miraculous gifts to you, or spiritual gifts to you, which is very, very interesting. Now, looking at the theme of the book of Romans, the theme is that the gospel is God's power for salvation to everyone who believes. First, to the Jews and also to the Gentile. We can, we can all agree that Romans chapter 1 verse 16 is the, is the theme of the, of, the, of the letter to the Romans. You know, whereby he said, I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God to save everyone who believes, whether you are a Jew or a Gentile. So, without the gospel, there is no salvation. And we really appreciate what happened through the gospel. We know that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 1 to verse 4. Now, looking at the key word in the book of Romans, the key word is righteousness. Paul is concerned about us being righteous. And this righteousness did not come from our own doings, right? We have been made righteous. I'm sure we are thinking of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, where the Bible says, God made Christ who had no sin to be seen for us, so that in Him we may become the righteousness of God. So without the gospel, without Jesus Christ, we cannot be made righteous. Without Jesus Christ, we remain sinners. I'm sure we all appreciate what Christ did. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the angel is talking to Joseph, 
and he said to Joseph, Mary will give birth to a son and you will name him Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. And here we are this morning. We all look so beautiful, isn't it? Beautiful and handsome because of the blood of Jesus Christ. But Christ, you look beautiful this morning. Alright? And the key phrase is chapter 1, verse 5, whereby we need to make the gospel known to all nations. This is um, our primary purpose as the church. The work of the church is to preach the gospel. And when we don't preach the gospel, we need to ask ourselves, why are we here? You know, we have been saved to save others. And wherever we are, whether at your workplace, whether in your classroom, people must know that you are a Christian. It is surprising that some of us, our best friends, don't know that we are Christians. Isn't it? That is strange. Some of us, we left our friends around 2 a.m. because we're busy partying with them. It's like, hey, I'm going to conduct your supper. Let me go to, to rest. I will see you after church. It's not supposed to be like that, isn't it? Why? Because we are the light of the world. Everyone must see us and must see that we are the way that leads to heaven, that leads to salvation. Now, the key chapter is chapter 12. Chapter 12 is the key chapter of the book of Romans whereby he is encouraging us to Christian living. He said, present your bodies a living sacrifice. And verse 2, be not conformed to this world. And he continued by saying that in verse 4 and verse 5, as we have many members um, in one body, and more members have not the same office, so we being many are one body in Christ, and all members one of another. So we all meet each other as the body of Christ. We are all members of that body. So this is something that Paul is doing in this book. He's reminding us about our purpose. Now verse 9 to verse 10, he said, Let love be without hypocrisy. You know, hate what is evil and hate what is good. Our love must be genuine. Our love must be real. We are living in the world whereby people are hungry for love. Guess what? You come to Christ, you find love. And here we are. We need to love one another genuinely. Don't fake love. Love cannot be faked. Yes, people can pretend to love you, but in the church, we don't, have to pretend, uh, we don't have to pretend, right? Even outside the church, we need to give people agape, which is the highest level of love, or which is called unconditional love. After verse 21 of Romans chapter 12, he said, Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. It reminded me of the saying that says, you cannot fight fire with fire, otherwise you are going to end up having much ashes. So in order for us to overcome evil, we don't have to be evil. We need to be good. Okay? We need water to quench fire. We don't need fire on top of another fire. So Paul says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And this is something that we must constantly be doing as Christians. Now the subject of the book of Romans is justification is by obedience faith in Christ. We cannot be justified outside Christ. Are we together? Amen. There is no justification outside Christ. I feel sorry for those who are so committed out there in their faith and they are ignoring Jesus Christ and they think they are going to make it. When you read John chapter 14 verse 6, Jesus Christ said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one goes to the Father except through me. You cannot be justified without Christ. So we need Jesus Christ. And remember, not only faith, as some people are teaching out there, just believe all is well. No. That's not the meaning of the word faith. Faith means faithfulness. You believe and you obey. As we see in our favorite hymn, trust and obey. That is what faith means. Not only just I believe. No. It is belief and doing that which you believe. That is why you can't separate faith and obedience. So we are going to be justified by our obedient faith in Jesus Christ. So God is not interested in us just being Christians. He wants us to be doers of the word. John chapter 14 verse 15. If you love me, keep my commandments. The appeal of the letter, it is saying to us that the gospel of Christ is, is the only power of God for salvation. Which means that without the gospel, there is no salvation. We take Jesus Christ out of the picture, we have zero. We are not God's children, we are God's enemies, 
there is no eternal life, we are going to be condemned. But when we put Jesus Christ, there is reconciliation between us and God. God is no longer our enemy. We are no longer enemies of God. We are his sons and daughters. Okay? Because of the gospel, we are now saved. We are the righteousness of God. So that is why we cannot take away the gospel. Now, all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ, we are having the opportunity of becoming new people. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. If anyone is in Jesus Christ, he's a new creature. The old has gone. Now let's go to my text, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 to verse 2. Verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service. The word beseech, depending on your translation, the word beseech, Beseech means to ask someone urgently or fervently or to ask someone passionately to do something. I am begging you. So Paul is begging us to do what? To present our bodies a living sacrifice. So this appeal goes to all Christians. God has shown us love whereby we can say he gave us the highest level of love. Now, he wants us to be grateful for that. He wants us not to take it for granted. The fact that God so loved the world and he gave this one and only begotten uh, son, Jesus Christ, so that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. He wants us to be grateful. So now in turn, there's something that we need to do. Jesus Christ said um, in John, in Luke chapter, chapter 9, verse 23 to verse 25, he said, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever will save his life shall lose it, but whoever will lose his life for my sake, he shall save it. For what is a man profited if he gains the whole world and loses himself or is cast away? Christ is telling us what is it that we need to do. Being a Christian means to take up our cross daily and follow Jesus Christ. What does this mean? This means that you are a Christian every day. You are a Christian all the time. You are not a Christian for two hours Sunday morning from 10 to 12. I'm a Christian. Hello, brothers and sisters. Oh, I love you so much. After that, I'm putting off this Christian jacket and I'm putting the world jacket. That's not what it means to be a Christian. So when you come to my workplace, for example, let's say I wear a table jacket and you are coming and say, I'm looking for Lawrence. They don't have to say, I'm talking about a thief, whereby his belt is a brave horse every day. He's a thief, this guy. You know, his blood proof is a steak, beef. He's still, this guy is a thief. They mustn't say that. You know, you come to my workplace, or come to a workplace, and you're looking for Sister Kuko. They will say, oh, okay, she's here. How are you related? <laughs> no, she's my sister in the Lord. They must even be shocked that no, Lawrence was preaching yesterday. It's like, is he a preacher? Oh, I'm shocked. <laughs> okay, it must not be that way. We need to be Christians every day, wherever you are. And this can be possible. You know why? Because there's a secret to that. Now, Jesus Christ explained what it means to be his disciple. It is a lifetime commitment. For those who are thinking of taking off or leave and start afresh 2024, please don't do it. Don't ever go through that route. To be a Christian means an everyday thing. It's a commitment that has to be expressed every day. We live by faith, not sometimes, not when the situation is tough. No, we live by faith all the time. Now, we are to carry our crosses daily and follow our master through thick and thin. Backward, never, forward, ever. When you think of giving up, please don't. I'm sure so far we can all agree that we need to hand ourselves over to Jesus Christ. As we sang the song, the chorus, they are a mind no more. I've been bought with the blood. I am mine no more. This means that you don't have any certain percentage with you. You belong to Christ 100%. Not 90% and I'm left with 10%. No, that's not what it 
it means to be a Christian. Now he said, we must present our bodies for a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God, which is our reasonable service. Now Paul is using the idea of a priest who offers a sacrifice. The sacrifice has to be a perfect animal. We all know Leviticus chapter 1 from verse 3 and you go to verse 9. The, the animal which is supposed to be presented is, it is a pure animal. For example, Jesus Christ is a lamb without blemish. That is how pure God wanted sacrifices to be done. Now, we must offer our bodies as a living sacrifice to God. Paul is not writing about that. He's not saying that we need to die physically this and that. No, no, no. He is, he is explaining how Christians should live their lives in this world. This is what Paul is saying. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 to verse 20. He said, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, whom you have, whom you have of God, and you are not your own, for you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. This is the reminder that we need to take care of our bodies. You are not a Christian spiritually, then your body, this body cannot be controlled. As we have read in the books of history, there are many who are teaching that this body is so evil that it cannot be controlled. So I'm a Christian inside. Don't take what this body is doing serious. Really, that, that's a contradiction of what it means to be a Christian. Okay? Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. So God wants the all of you. I'm sure you are thinking of the song from the legend, uh, from the legend, right? That song, I, I love you whole, the whole of you. You can't say, my wife cannot say she loves me, me, but she doesn't like my hand, my head. You don't love me. Okay? If you love me, you must love the whole package. No, let's I love you, but I don't love the physical part of you. Guess what? You don't love me. So that's what it means to be a Christian. Your whole being. Last time I was here, Brother Chris gave us a Bible study. Um, and he highlighted something about the meaning of soul. Soul is everything that you are. Your character, your attitude, your behavior, your thoughts. You know? So when the Bible says love the Lord your God with all your soul, he wants all of us to love him. And this is what it means. So this is what Paul is saying to us. We need to take care of our physical being. I think it's a lesson on its own. But I will, um, next time we need to talk about healthy living. Okay? Healthy living. Whether we must talk about this body. Because most of the time we neglect the body. And the Bible is a lot to say concerning the body, our physical part of it. So the Holy Spirit lives in us. That is why we need to take care of this body. The Holy Spirit lives in you. That is why it is important that we are to take care of, of this body. We are no longer our own, which means Christ owns us 100%. We have no percentage left in us. Therefore, hand yourself over. Let us commit ourselves to, to God. We must do our best to use every part of our body in a manner that pleases God. We must use our feet so that we can go where God wants us to go to preach the gospel. Our primary job as the church is to preach the gospel. Now let us not compromise evangelism in the church. All the ministries in the church must lead us to evangelism, all of them. We must use our hands to give practical help to other people. We must use our hands to give practical help to other people. Number three, we must use our ears to listen to other people's problems. This world is taking people who listen. Some of us, the way we go to master, listen and speak our skills. Before somebody finishes, we have an answer. Which is not a good thing, isn't it? And the Bible says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. You know, some of us, our exercise is to jump into confusions. You don't see me here. I'm not let them distract you. That's why it's not here. You never give me a call. You call me or you come to my place. You find me that I'm sick. But you're ready to talk people. Not 
knowledge is not serious. I'm so serious. <laughs> we must use our mouth to encourage other people and to tell them good news about Christ. Some of us, when it comes to talking, our, our words pierces people. You know, some of us, we are scared of talking to you. Before you thought, it's like, I know I'm going to be that. So therefore, I'm not a new person. I know him, I know him. You know, so let us, let us mind our tongues, you know. Let us be careful of what we are saying through our words. Now, when we use our body, as I've mentioned, this becomes a perfect sacrifice to God. He wants us to use our bodies in a way that pleases Him. So therefore, our worship would not just be a statement. I went to church, so what? I mean, anyone can be here. So, worshiping God is more than coming to the assembly. It is more of a lifestyle, more than anything else. We mustn't be like the, like the Pharisees who were focusing on the outward appearance while inside Jesus Christ said, your heart are dirty. So God wants us to love him with all our beings. Now the right kind of worship is to present our bodies a living sacrifice. God wants us to be holy in all our conducts and this will please him in return. So it is not a matter of I gave God money, I came to church, they saw my face. It's more than that. It is more of a lifestyle. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20. I love this one. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the faith, I live by faith toward the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself on my behalf. This is what it means to be a Christian. Paul says, I've been crucified with Christ. Christ is the one who took over. It is no longer the who lives, but Christ lives in me. And as long as I live in this flesh, I'm going to live by faith in the Son of God, who gave himself on my behalf. This is what it means to be a Christian. Now, reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15, the Bible says, Christ died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but living to please Jesus Christ, who died for us, who gave his life for us. Now, to be a Christian, it means that we belong to Christ. How much percentage? All of us. 100% all of you belong to Christ. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, in order to prove by you what is that good and easy and perfect will of God. The word conformed means to, to, to be fashioned alike. It means to match up to. So in other words, for those who have watched many documentary of criminal investigation, you know this guy is in his computer and they are looking for the face that will match the person that they found and the person that they want. So if we put the face of Jesus Christ here, my face must match that of Christ. This is the meaning of the word, being a Christian. It means that I match Christ. Unless, until I make Christ, I'm not a Christian. You know, and you can all agree that being a Christian is not public place, isn't it? It's tough. But guess what? We are not alone. God is with us. We people are able to become that which He wants us to be. And that is why it becomes doable. Do you know why? Because He's talking about the renewal of our minds. Unless the mind changes, nothing changes. That is why when you talk about the word repentance, repentance means change of thinking, which is to change your behavior. You will never stop the wrong that you do until you change the way you think. Change the way you think, everything changes. That is why we mustn't be conformed to the pattern of this world. This world has its own way of doing things. Now we who are in Christ, we used to be there, we know how the world operates. Now we have changed, we have repented. That is why now we are no longer like of those of this world. We are now made in the image of God. 
which now we need to please God at all times, not sometimes. Now, when you go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 19, we are talking about works of flesh. The works of flesh which are obvious. You don't have to question whether are they there or not. They are obvious. And he mentioned them. And he said, those who live like this want to make it to heaven. And he's talking to Christians. So in other words, for us to be in Christ, we need to stop doing things that are not pleasing to God. Now, instead of being conformed to the pattern of this world, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The word transformed means to change. It means to convert. It means to renew. It means to renovate. We have been renovated in Jesus Christ. When you look at me, I'm not under the old Lawrence. Why? Because from Romans chapter 6, verse 4, the old Lawrence has been buried. Where? In baptism. I'm sure I'm not the only one who sometimes see ghosts. It's like Lawrence, this is the this is the old Lawrence. Why is he coming back? Because the old one is buried. Why is this ghost back? Okay, so Christians must change the way they think. The word change is the same word that is described in Jesus' body. When you go to make it, Mark chapter 9, verse 2, on the Mark of Transfiguration, his body was, was, was changed. And I'm talking about the time whereby uh, Elijah and Moses appeared. And that is the meaning of the word change. You need to change. You are not under the same. So you can't say, I've been Christian, but ah, all the habits are still there. There's nothing that I can do about it. No. You need to put them to bed. In my conclusion of the conclusion, we can all agree that to be a Christian, it's, it takes a lot of work to be done. We need to get up and surrender. We sing a hymn called to disaster surrender about such things because they are defining what it means to be a Christian. If you still own certain percentage to yourself, I'm suggesting this morning that let us give them up and give Jesus Christ under the test. By the way, he said do not worry about giving me your life. You know what? You are going to get it back. But those who refuse to give me their life, they are going to lose it anyway. So in other words, to be a Christian is a win-win situation. I'm thinking of the advent of numbers, a win-win situation. <laughs> We are not going to lose anything. In fact, from the Bible study that the pastor was teaching, he addressed the issue of righteousness. When we are talking about godliness, godliness is the number one thing which is being underestimated, underrated in this world. When you are godly, you are rich more than anyone else. And that is what we need to do. Now, let us hand ourselves over to Jesus Christ while it is called today. Stop telling me about the time to come. It's too late. Let, let us do it now. Let us present our bodies and living sacrifice. Holy. Now, be holy as God who called you is holy. Stop trying. Now that I'm trying to quit this, no. Stop trying and do your best. This is what's needed. Stop trying. Trying is not enough until you do your best. For those who are writing exams, can you please stop trying to, to study and do your best? I'm trying. No, do your best. Now, for us to achieve this, we must not be conformed to the pattern of this world. For us to hand ourselves over, we need to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. You have the powerful weapon with you, and that is your mind. That is your way. That is where God operates in everything that you do. Are you willing to do this? Are you willing to come to me? Come to me, I'm going to help you. It's all about a will more than anything else. Stop wishing and do it. We must do whatever it takes to guide our hearts, to guide our minds at all times. Because serving God requires repentance. And no matter how much one loves you, they cannot repent all your behalf. Isn't it? I cannot change all my words behind. Let them I'm here to repent for my wife. What's wrong with them? I know, brethren, that we have our concerns, 
our worries, anxiety, you know, that can affect our thinking. The Bible told us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, be anxious for nothing. Uskawara. Don't stress. You know, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guide your heart and mind to Christ Jesus. We need not to worry and cast our worries to God because God cares for us. We are not alone. Let us choose to trust in the Lord in all our circumstances because it is impossible for God to run. Let us allow God to rule us, to, to, to own us because we know we are not going to miss anything outside Christ. In fact, we are grateful for the life that we have in Jesus Christ because when you look at our previous lives, we were in trouble if it was not because of Jesus Christ. So this morning, let us choose to hand ourselves over to, to God. Maybe you are thinking of being baptized. Maybe you thought you were going to start praying, praying for a fresh being baptized, or maybe changing. Today is the day of salvation. We don't know what tomorrow will hold or what this afternoon is having. Let us choose to commit ourselves to Christ. Thank you for listening.